You are in the sunshine. Look at him. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to uh, the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral. I was just talking to the robin. We've come actually up onto the Bastion Garden. For the first time this year, I asked Fletcher if we might come up here, and I'll explain why uh, much later in our reflection. But be welcome wherever you are. It's interesting that uh, we'd not been up here at all this year, and it took about five minutes for our friend the robin to find us, and he's sitting on the wall here, and I think you'll probably see him from time to time, because he's all around at the moment, loving being up here. We also, though, have He's gone over there to sit in the sunshine, such as it is. Uh, Leo here. Now, some of you have got in touch with us after, after Leo was startling, spectacularly sick yesterday on the uh, morning prayer. Um, he does absolutely gobble his food, and sometimes it's as though he's stocking up for goodness knows how long, and it's too much for him, and that's all that happened. So uh, he then went off and was uh, perfectly well for the rest of the day, and is, is, has had some breakfast and is, is sitting here peacefully at the moment, and well away from the robin. Uh, please uh, feel welcome and bring your own prayers and intentions. Of course, we are praying ardently and in heart and mind and in everything we have to offer for the people of Ukraine at this terrible time. And you will remember yesterday that I spoke about uh, Yulia Campbell, who is our events organiser, and said that she was not going to come to the, the, the King's Legacy lunch yesterday because her parents and family are in Mariupol and she's had no word from that stricken city which has been devastated by 24-hour bombing going on the whole time and civilians cowering in their cellars as this terrible bombardment goes on. She's not had news of her family now for 12 days. And Yulia has this morning been on BBC Breakfast Time television, national television, speaking with enormous courage about uh, the state of, of what Mariupol, which she grew up in, must be like now. It's mostly a Russian-speaking Ukrainian city, but at the same time, the civilian population are being bombed and bombed and bombed, and humanitarian corridors which have been planned so many times have all failed at the moment because they themselves were targeted when, when they began to open up. So we pray not only for Julia's family but all those who are in Mariupol and also the other cities of Ukraine. I hardly have to say it these days that our prayers are so much directed to them and if you want the way in which you can help then yesterday uh, if you've not seen yesterday's morning prayer tune back to it because it gives you all the details of how particularly the Order of Malta which is working at relief both inside Ukraine and in the nations round about Hungary, Poland, Slovakia uh, and, and uh, the, the Moldova, all of those nations around they have relief agencies in helping refugees to come from that but also yesterday there's a description of the city of Lviv because the ambassador of the order had been there and we had had a, a half hour conversation about it. Those of you who've already seen that will, will know but there are ways of helping put on there so go back to that we won't repeat ourselves too much today but we will begin our prayers so bring your own concerns and intentions as we start on this Monday morning the 14th of March O Lord open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise hear our voice O Lord according to your faithful love according to your judgment give us life blessed are you God of compassion and mercy to you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn, and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit, and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. The 
14th morning of the month gives us the possibility of two psalms, 71, which I've sometimes read with you. Uh, it suits me because it says, do not cast me away in the time of old age, and at the same time, forsake me not, O God, when I am old and grey-headed, till I make known your deeds to the next generation and your power to all that are to come. But I'm not going to read that one this morning, I'm going to read 72 because it's got uh, the sense of the cheerful re reawakening of all creation being offered to God and it ends uh, with a, a hymn of praise to God. Psalm 72 Give the king your judgment, O God, and your righteousness to the son of a king. Then shall he judge your people righteously and your poor with justice. May the mountains bring forth peace, and the little hills righteousness for the people. May he defend the poor among the people, deliver the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live as long as the sun and moon endure from one generation to another. May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like the showers that water the earth, in his time shall righteousness flourish, and abundance of peace, till the moon shall be no more. May his dominion extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. May his foes kneel before him, and his enemies lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall pay tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall bring gifts. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall do him service, for he shall deliver the poor that cry out, the needy and those who have no helper. He shall have pity on the weak and poor. He shall preserve the lives of the needy. He shall redeem their lives from oppression and violence, and dear shall their blood be in his sight. Long may he live, unto him may be given gold from Sheba. May prayer be made for him continually, and may they bless him all the day long. May there be abundance of grain on the earth, standing thick upon the hilltops. May its fruit flourish like Lebanon, and its grain grow like the grass of the field. May his name remain for ever, and be established as long as the sun endures. May all nations be blessed in him, and call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wonderful things, and blessed be his glorious name for ever. May all the earth be filled with his glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the psalmist, prophesying forward the coming of the Anointed One, and therefore it's very much, uh, shall we say, a hymn to welcome the coming of the Christ, the Anointed One. The psalmist is hundreds of years before writing this hymn of praise. But there are lovely sentences in it and they remind us of the way in which creation renews itself and also uses similes in order to show the refreshment that the Anointed One will bring coming down like showers upon the mown grass, watering the earth. And then verse 16, which made me feel sad this morning. May there be abundance of grain on the earth, standing thick upon the hilltops. Sad, because I was reading earlier on one of the news bulletins that the grain has not been planted in Ukraine this year and the sunflower seeds have not been planted because of all the war that is going on and the people don't feel safe to plant and sow and that will mean uh, an enormous shortage because y Ukraine is responsible for so much of the wheat grain that is in the, and the wheat that is grown and that will mean a shortage of, of foods around but at the moment people are used to that because they know that this war must end and peace must be re-established. But for the moment there will be shortages and the abundance of grain on the earth has been paused in Ukraine. 
because of war breaking out and peace for the moment having ceased. May the mountains bring forth peace and the little hills righteousness for the people, says this psalm. And we say Amen to that for the people of Ukraine. Let's go back though now to, we, we missed yesterday because it was a Sunday, a different lesson, but we, we're coming back now to the Gospel of St. John. And I'm back in chapter 6. This really is the heartland of the teaching of Jesus in this Gospel. It's also the heartland of what the evangelist wants to say to us, the message the evangelist is giving of receiving the truth of heaven and the good news of heaven on two different planes, that which is earthbound but still full of signs of the evangel, of the good news, of the gospel, and that which is heaven sent and eternal. And as we've said over and over again, Jesus in his conversation and in the similes and metaphors and prophecies and everything else he uses works on both planes and is constantly trying to get the people to, shall we say, lift off in vision using the signs of creation to help them lift off so that they have a spiritual perception of what is going on and never more so than today. I'm starting at verse 41 of chapter 6, which of course began with the feeding of the 5,000 and that sentence of Jesus to his disciples who were going to carry on the work of sh uh, sharing that good news, gather up the fragments that nothing be lost and each of them fills a basket, 12 baskets of fragments and of course there also we're working on a real plane, a physical plane with the bread, the barley loaves which have been broken and shared and we're working also with the bread from heaven and Jesus is going to be speaking in both those, shall we call them planes at the moment or dimensions this morning. Verses 41 to 51 of chapter 6 in the fourth gospel form our lesson for today. Here we are. <clears throat> so the Jewish authorities <clears throat> grumbled about Jesus <clears throat> because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, but is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your forebears ate the manna in the wilderness, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Speaking in two dimensions all the time for those who can receive that message. And he is longing for them to receive that message. We have here three of the I am statements. Short passage, just 41 to 51 in its verses. And as we read those 11 verses, we have three of the I am statements. 
I am the bread that came down from heaven. And then later, I am the bread of life. Your forebears ate the manna in the wilderness. And all of those statements, there are three of them as we go through. And that, again, in the present tense, the I am statement, but of course, going back to God naming himself to Moses by the burning bush. I am, when Moses says, tell me your name, I am who I am, the present tense of the verb to be, for God is always in the present. But it is a message that they're finding it hard to take. So that I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The nourishment I will give for the life of all peoples is every atom of my physical being and humanity, raised high, with arms outstretched and hands and feet pinned and wounded, as all peoples are drawn to that nourishment and feed on that for eternal life. That's an interpretation. But they themselves are not at that time able to receive that. And that statement is going to make them take massive offence. Already they've been saying, well, how can this person be from heaven if we know his parents and we know where he comes from? And these are people who know Nazareth and Galilee and they've seen Jesus grow up. But at the same time, they're not willing to receive what is being given by the anointed one that the psalmist was looking forward to receiving. So that those I am statements becomes, become really important as we go on. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. And I am the living bread. Three, three statements. So, as I say, this is the core heartland of the Gospel. It gives meaning to everything that Jesus does when he takes the bread at his farewell to those who have gathered the fragments and tried to make sense of them. Let nothing be lost, for every piece of this jigsaw for them, each one of them, will make sense. But I think we have to go beyond into the, onto the lakeside and that last chapter of St. John before anything begins really to make sense for them and then right out into their own ministry and what happens to them in the world, the Twelve. And for us too, we gain the jigsaw pieces bit by bit in different situations of life. That vision comes and is given to us by grace. So let's um, think. I've got two people I want to think about this morning. And the, the first uh, is an interesting character called Alfred O'Shaughnessy. He was a, a, a person who worked for most of his short life, he died at the age of 36, in the British Museum. And he was of Irish, as his name gives, an Irish uh, descent. But he also was a poet. And in the British Museum, at first he was just a copywriter, but then he was moved to the zoological department and became a really expert herpetologist. That, that means someone who is expert in reptiles and amphibians. And he became so expert at that, that after his early death, uh, the cataloguing of the British Museum uh, attributed to him four new different types of lizards. And when the Latin names were given, uh, then his own name was tacked on the end to those four different types. O'Shaughnessy and then an I at the end to show that it came from him. And that was the honour given to him after his death. 
but Sholos he seemed to me to live quite a tragic life. For uh, seven years before his death, he, he met the love of his life called Eleanor, and they had two children, both of whom died in early infancy. And at the same time, uh, Eleanor herself, after the years of married life, if I get the, the dates right for him, uh, they were married in 1873, and Eleanor died in 1879, and the two children had died, and at the same time O'Shaughnessy lived on till 1881, and so that's uh, two years after his wife died, he also died. And you sort of feel with him that he died of heartbreak. From the time of his marriage, all his poetry stopped because I think he felt that his vision now was with Eleanor and everything that was going on. But before that he had written poems. And there is one poem, one poem called um, the, an ode. And it was in his book of poetry which were, was published uh, in 1874 called Music and Moonlight. And this poem I knew, or I knew three verses of it from an early age, because three of the verses were in our school hymn book, Songs of Praise, verses 2, 3 and 4. But verse 1 is the most famous of all the verses. Now I'm going to read the whole poem to you. It's a poem called The Music Makers, and it's about the vision that those who create songs words or music, the vision that they hand on to people who, who sing and sing their words and music. So here is the first verse and you'll see within it not only the famous fame of the first line or the first two lines but also there's a, a, there are three words that we use in a particular way and you'll spot them and he invented that term. <clears throat> so here's O'Shaughnessy's poem, The Music Makers. We are the music makers, and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers, and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers, on whom the pale moon gleams. Yet we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. With wonderful deathless ditches, we build up the world's great cities, and out of a fabulous story, we fashion an empire's glory. One man with a dream at pleasure shall go forth and conquer a crown, and three with a new song's measure can trample a kingdom down. We, in the ages lying, in the buried past of the earth, built Nineveh with our sighing, and Babel itself in our mirth, and overthrew them with prophesying to the old of the new world's worse. For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth. A breath of our inspiration is the life of each generation, a wondrous thing of our dreaming, unearthly, impossible seeming. The soldier, the king, and the peasant are working together in one till our dream shall become their present and their work in the world be done. They had no vision amazing of the goodly house they are raising. They had no divine foreshowing of the land to which they are going. But on one man's soul it has broken a light that doth not depart and his look or a word he hath spoken wrought flame in another man's heart. And therefore today is thrilling with a past day's late fulfilling and the multitudes are enlisted in the faith that their fathers resisted and scorning the dream of tomorrow are bringing to pass as they may in the world for its joy or its sorrow the dream that was scorned yesterday. But we with our dreaming and singing, ceaseless and sorrowless we, the glory about us clinging of the glorious futures we see, our souls with high music ringing, 
Oh, men, it must ever be that we dwell in our dreaming and singing a little apart from ye. For we are afar with the dawning and the suns that are not yet high, and out of the infinite morning intrepid you hear us cry. How, spite of your human scorning, once more God's future draws nigh, and already goes forth the warning that ye of the past must die. Great hail, we cry to the comers, from the dazzling unknown shore. Bring us hither your sun and your summers, and renew our world as of yore. You shall teach us your songs new numbers, and things that we dream not before. Yea, in spite of a dreamer who slumbers, and a singer who sings no more. From that short life, Arthur O'Shaughnessy passed us that poem. As I said, those verses 2, 3 and 4 we used to sing as a hymn in the hymn book, Songs of Praise. But the first verse has in it the couplet, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. They're mystic lines asking you to have a vision and realize theirs. And they crop up in all sorts and different ways um, in the, 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 the film of the role of Dahl, Willy Wonka. Uh, Willy Wonka suddenly turns to the children uh, who are finding it all rather mysterious when they're, do you remember, they're licking the, the, the fruits painted on the, the wallpaper and each fruit tastes magnificently and almost magically of what the fruit should taste of. And then he suddenly leans over and says, we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. But the other thing he gives us is, yet we are the movers and shakers. Now we use that word quite often about those who are movers and shakers and they're generally those that we see to be powerful. He gave us that phrase. But he's not speaking about those who are powerful in temple terms. He's actually speaking of the way in which those who sing songs, write poetry, dream dreams and hand them on are the real movers and shakers. It's no wonder to me that Sir Edward Elgar chose to write a, a whole, almost an oratorio, on this ode by Arthur O'Shaughnessy. Elgar wrote it for 1912, I think for the Birmingham Festival. But he was already feeling, he was a massive establishment composer by then, and he was already feeling that his wells of inspiration were running dry. And so what he did with this poem was to revisit moments of inspiration when he felt his flame burnt high. And if you listen to this Elgar piece, which has a full chorus and a full orchestra uh, and also a, a mezzo-soprano or an, 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 an alto voice singing, then you find that Elgar weaves into it moments of his own dreams and inspiration. You'll suddenly hear part of the Enigma variations, Enigma itself, which then gave us the, 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 the Nimrod theme as well, but it's there. You catch it on the air as though that was his dream then. But so often the dreams we had, we lose sight of if we're surrounded by all the things of the world. And Elgar by then certainly was, because he was a very famous composer and was part of the great establishment of the Edwardian age. But also you find that suddenly there's a moment from the dream of Gerontius, which of course was his early spiritual dream and which at this time he's trying somehow to recapture. But we well know that this never gained a great deal of popularity. It was too really introspective and relying on older themes, older visions, and he was trying to recapture a new vision. That never really happened until in the depths of sorrow in the middle of the Great War, the First World War, which depressed him hugely, he caught a new vision. 
with his wistful cello concerto, which has become such a very popular piece. But it's a different dream, and Elgar reawoke with that dream in the middle of that terrible crisis of war and gave the wistfulness of a, a new beginning there with his cello concerto. He's not the only one to have written music to this ode or for voices and, and uh, for instruments. The Hungarian composer Zoltan Kandai, who lived from the early 1880s until the mid-1960s and died in Budapest, so we're back again in Hungarian lands. He also wrote this ode, a much shorter version of it. For some people have just used bits and pieces of it, but it's all about vision and dreaming. And for O'Shaughnessy, it's the one thing that he's remembered for. For not many people actually remember his name because of the way in which they attached it to new species of lizards. But with this, Yes, he's remembered. He's there in the hymn book. He's there on the Elgar score. He's there on the Kodai score. And others have turned to these beautiful verses of how music from the past, which was trying to awaken a society, an empire that was growing and is now molded into dust in history. And yet the vision can be recaptured because of the poetry and of the music. And for that, we give great thanks because sometimes the jigsaw piece of that man or woman's dream is recaptured because of hearing the music or the verses that they wrote. And when they're performed or read aloud, that can happen. I wanted also to mention today that um, the writer, Hugh Walpole, Sir Hugh Walpole, who was born in March 1884, and uh, was his real date was yesterday, whereas uh, O'Shaughnessy's day, 14th of March, Hugh Walpole we missed yesterday, 13th of March, and died in 1941. But he himself was seen at that time as a, a great novelist. He, he, was, he was quite, um, should we say, quick in writing his stories, and he was criticized for that by other writers. But there is one book that a lot of his books have been forgotten. There is one book that he took time over and used past experiences, experiences from here, because he was our King's School, Canterbury, and his portrait is on the wall of our great um, school hall here. And at the same time, he knew Durham well, because his father worked uh, there at the cathedral. He was a priest, and so he found himself at, at Durham as well. And the book I'm talking about, which he, he wrote between 1918, when he came back from work in Russia in foreign service, and also before that in helping with the health service in Russia as the war broke out. But when he came back, he wrote quite carefully, and that was not like him normally, this novel, which is simply called The Cathedral. And it's a right title because although it's full of characters, the real overarching character in the book is the cathedral itself and how by its very power as a physical building it overarches and changes the lives of so many, not always for the good. So uh, when the review was written uh, I think it was The Guardian which wrote, No former novelist has seized quite so powerfully upon the cathedral fabric and made it a living character in the drama, an obsessing individuality at once benign and forbidding. The cathedral is a great book. And when uh, Walpole begins to give you the characters that are there, and I, I, I first heard this when I was uh, recovering, <laughs> of all things, from chickenpox at the age of, well, it was 1969, so that made me, uh, what, uh, 22. Um, and uh, I was at home 
in July and August uh, and was listening to a radio play on a Sunday afternoon and I actually checked this out you can do this these days and and, and uh, asked Google when uh, when the, the cathedral was performed on the radio and it instantly came up it was performed between July the 27th Sunday afternoon August the 3rd Sunday afternoon August the 10th 1969 it took me back to hearing that play with Stephen Murray playing the tragic figure of Archdeacon Adam Brandon whom when we start is the proud controller of the cathedral the, the Dean is far too interested in his books and library and everything else Dean Sampson the Bishop Bishop Purcell who's in extreme old age and living out at the palace which wasn't in Polchester as he calls it and then the canons who are a, a mixed bunch of Canon Rhonda, Canon Ryle, Canon Bentinck Major and the whole story is about how Canon Rhonda arrives and determines that he is going to unseat the Archdeacon from the position of power and influence in the cathedral and it becomes a really tragic tale as it goes through but the cathedral itself is nothing like Trollope there's no comic side to this it is a story of uh, tragedy and downfall because Archdeacon Brandon had embraced the whole cathedral in the wrong way and was receiving it in the wrong way and at the end there is this tragic breakup of his not only his own character but the ramifications for his poor wife and his son and his daughter in this I found it I went instantly to my friend Miss Middleton at the local library and said do you have the cathedral by uh, uh, by uh, uh, Hugh Walpole and she says we do have that and so she handed it to me and I took it home and read it I, I read it after the second episode so by the time I got to episode three because it was Sunday afternoons each week um, I knew the story which is always a difficult thing because you shouldn't really read the end of the book before hearing but the radio play was magnificently done and those voices still stay in my mind and the warning about what these huge buildings uh, and you think of it in in the way in that that novel the spire uh, uh, as well with uh, William Golding who is, is well known to us for Lord of the Flies but how in the spire it's the building of the cathedral which in the end is the downfall of the hero there and those those kinds of ways in which we have to watch ourselves humbly receiving things on a spiritual dimension giving ourselves time to embrace the vision that is given to us even in something like the cathedral I'm sitting here in this bastion garden now I asked to come here this morning and Fletcher didn't know the reason that we're coming here and still doesn't look he, he uh, acceded to my request to be the person who chose where to come this is a summer garden it's on the top of one of the bastions of the old wall with its deep Roman foundations but on the top when we came here and climbed up the steps this was simply shall we say a very boring concrete floor with a drain in the middle it sloped slightly to let the water through and at first of course it, it stayed just like that and then let me not um, spare his blushes uh, Fletcher had the vision that this could be a very special place and so for anyone coming here it's it's mostly a spring summer early autumn garden and that's why it's the first time we've come here but you will remember it from many readings and prayers here in the sunshine and the vision was to create a garden here up high amongst the branches of the trees so we were at that level of the birds and to pump some water up which would go round and round and be pumped back again and again so that the birds when you're here and the best time to be here is very very early 
on a, a morning in late spring, early summer, when you're up, it's totally light, the world isn't up, and birds come down and wash and they show huge pleasure. But they're the sort of birds that actually are happier up high. And so the number of birds that we've seen here are manifold. But at the same time, Fletcher's vision was that everything around here would be expressive of plants in different parts of the world, many of them from the Mediterranean landscape and some of them alpine plants as well. But I'm sitting next to a daisy which is already flowering, but then this hebe, which is quite a rare one, from uh, New Zealand. And it's obviously flourishing here and then going round to the various palms and everything else. Some things have to be, particular succulents, have to be taken into greenhouses during the winter and are yet to be brought out again because this garden isn't yet developed. But the creation of all this and the moving of, of uh, stones from his own family's home at, uh, at Ash nearby um, caused people rather like the, uh, the grumbling uh, people with Jesus to say, I think you're mad, what on earth are you doing? Uh, nothing was disturbed below, the drain is still there and you see the water pouring through it, but at the same time the flat stones have given an opportunity for something which when people began to say and grumble and say, well you're perfectly mad doing this and giving no encouragement at all, and yet now, when any of you have been here and climbed up to here, this special place, instantly there is a, a wow, this really is a, a very special place indeed. And it is. And <laughs> our difficulty is always, when you bring people up, if they have that kind of gardening vision, you can't get them down again. They will always want to sit here and sit here and sit here because this is, and they talk and they're happy and so we have then to say, well, maybe we don't have lunch inside, we have lunch here. Um, and the, the, the lovely leaves of the ash tree or the bay tree, which is evergreen and so it's over me now and where the robin has been sitting, but our friend Leo has been guarding everything against his enemy, the robin, <laughs> at the moment. Um, but all of that uh, has become part of the vision of a garden and I remember uh, a, a, a lady coming round the garden with me when Fetter was busy planting trees and this must have been I don't know 15 or so years ago um, and uh, she said but why are you planting trees it's not your garden so you won't be benefiting uh, one day you'll have to leave this when I plant things in my garden. I know it's my garden, but we've been stewards of this garden for 21 years now, and you don't plant for yourself. You plant with a vision for the garden and for the future. Well, now, of course, planting trees is a sacred duty. That wasn't so evident then, but it has become so. And uh, the, the Queen has asked us to plant as many trees as possible for the Platinum Jubilee. The Queen's green canopy. All of that, when someone has a vision, and very often people will stand and say, what a waste of time, what a waste of money, what a, what a madcap exercise. And then suddenly the vision becomes what it always was in the other person's heart. It becomes something that is totally precious and people sort of imagining that, yes, well, we were part of that vision and, well, yes, you were, but you were actually, you were actually saying it's, it's crazy. And then suddenly it sends itself round in a completely different direction because one is a steward of one's own creative gifts and gardening isn't particularly one of my creative gifts but we have all kinds of creative gifts within us which are released. And in that vision, very often when you are using the special gifts that God has given you, you seem to those around you not to be making any sense at all. And sometimes, like Alfred O'Shaughnessy, 
the torch is handed on with the words or the music for someone else to pick up and say, gosh, this man had huge vision, this O'Shaughnessy. Let's carry the torch on, whether it's Elgar or Kodai, with those words, or even Willy Wonka in the, or even, or even Fletcher standing there. Um, at that point, that vision is handed on. And we well know that other people will then take that on. And I'm sure uh, Leo has all kinds of visions, but I think they mostly contain things about the birds and the robins this morning. That all of those things, as we think of a vision, a vision of peace for Ukraine, when the wheat can be planted again, and the sunflowers can be planted again, and they will grow up. But empires rise and empires fall, and the movers and shakers, that were those words that uh, Alfred O'Shaughnessy give to us in his poem, the movers and shakers seem to be the political ones with great power, who are using the weapons of the age to create their vision, and it crumbles and falls. It's like Kipling's poem, Recessional. The far called our navies melt away, and the empires are of, of our own day at that time, he was writing in 1900, are one with Nineveh and Tyre. Well, O'Shaughnessy mentions Nineveh, but the songs that build that empire, sometimes the vision will be handed on in a completely different way. And the last verse of that um, music makers deserves to be read again. Great hail we cry to the comers from the dazzling unknown shore. Bring us hither your sun and your summers and renew our world as of yore. You shall teach us your songs new numbers and things that we dream not before, yea, in spite of a dreamer who slumbers and a singer who sings no more. O'Shaughnessy is someone who, in earthly terms, slumbers and sings no more, but his songs still sing and his vision is still bright. So on this day, when vision is very much what we need in a world which is once again plunging itself into war and conflict, we give thanks for those moments when creative writing issues a vision of music and song and, and, and ditties, as uh, O'Shaughnessy calls it, which was the, the first verse of our uh, school hymn book, hymn, which began with the second verse of the poem, which says, uh, with wonderful deathless ditties, we build up the world's great cities. All of that, that vision, or Hugh Walpole's warning to people like me who have care of a cathedral, that that care is of course important, but it's not nearly as important as the vision that goes with it. And sometimes they can be in terrible conflict and one therefore has always to hold one's vision against the figure of Jesus, the anointed one that the psalmist was prophesying in all his humility as Jesus stood among the people and noticed where God's good gifts and graces were most necessary. Let's say our prayers on this particular day. We are, oh, uh, cheerfully, uh, at last, going to pray for the parishes of the uh, Maidstone Area Deanery. And we're starting with Allington St Nicholas and Maidstone St Peter. And we pray for Chris Lavender and the ministry of those parishes. Pray in the Anglican Communion for the Diocese of Kindu in the uh, province of L'Eglise Anglican du Congo, the Congo, and at the same time, French-speaking province. And at the same time, we pray for Justin, our Archbishop, and for Rose, Bishop of Dover, and Emma, Bishop at Lambeth. Bring your own prayers and intentions as we pray. Here's the collect for this week. Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such th things as are agreeable to the same through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the colleague for Lent. 
almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, praying for a vision to be realized in us with our creative gifts, we say, each in our own language, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Time for reflection now, and uh, some music from the music makers. Um, this, I think, is Elgar. That was an excerpt from Edward Elgar's The Music Makers, by the words by Alfred O'Shaughnessy. And uh, after we've had the blessing, then 
um, I've asked Fletcher to put on the um, Kodai, Zoltan Kodai, the Hungarian composer's ode in the same way the music makers. Uh, and uh, you'll hear the difference. But I thought as Kodai was very much Hungarian and died in Budapest, that it would be a good thing to put on this morning. I've also asked Fletcher to put in um, pictures of the uh, garden as it unfolds throughout the year so that you are reminded you've seen it uh, on the morning prayer from time to time when we've been up here reminded of how it develops through this morning has become quite warm because the, the sun's come round onto us and my little friend here leo is now reveling in the sunshine and looking quite fit and well so no need to worry about him i don't think though he has been keeping the robin at bay which is a, a sadness so they are, they are old adversaries, these two. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you would pray for today and always. Amen.